This, this clapping you just clap is not for Jesus. So. Hallelujah. See, whenever you want to do something for the Lord, it must be the best. No. See, if you clap for any other thing in this life more than you clap for Jesus, you know what it is? It's idolatry. And I know the day Nigeria won Cameroon at the African Cup of Nations, you were shouting here in Lagos. I was hearing you in Cameroon. I could hear you clap and shout that you have won. No. We must clap for Jesus even better than we clap for the indomitable lions. Better than we clap for the super ego. Better and louder! Better and louder! Yes! Yes! Hallelujah! Let me give you another reason to shout and even cloud louder. See, Jesus, if Jesus did not resurrect from the dead, see, it's not a story where if Jesus went to the grave and did not come out of there, who would have been of all men the most miserable? It is the resurrection of our Messiah that makes our faith a oh we are glad Jesus has conquered the grave Jesus has conquered death religions that are on the earth we are the only set of people that can say oh death where is your power oh death where is your sting yes yes hallelujah See, there is no apology about this. Even history, those who don't love the Lord Jesus like us, know it for real. It's, it's in the history books that they teach in school that our Messiah died and rose again. Hallelujah. Jesus' resurrection has become a historic fact. Even those who don't love Jesus, the occult, the atheists, and all the other religions, they know. They can't doubt it. Nobody disputes that. It's not something that we, we believe by faith is real. Yes, Hallelujah. So we have a reason to boast. We have a reason to shout. We have a reason to make noise. One more time, let's give it to all to Jesus. Clean to the old. Yes. And exchange. So I cherish the old rugged past Till my job is at last I lay
seated in the house of the Lord. Our joy, our privilege is that he chose us to bear his name. He, he, he is the one that came to us. We didn't go to him. I don't know about you. He came to me. He came to find me. I wasn't finding God when he saved me. I was not a religious person when he saved me. I was in my sins, living my life. I had my goals. I was pursuing my ambitions. And one day, it, it pleased him to reveal himself to me. See, until I, I go to meet him eternally, I will never cease to be amazed of how, of all the billions of human beings that are on the earth, he could look and see me. I don't know about you, but he spotted me. I wasn't anything special. See, I was 16 years old when he saved me. So there, there's no, I didn't have all this flesh, all this big body. I was small like this. There was nothing special about me. But his love traveled past ministers and presidents and senators and governors. And he came to look for me. I was in my village, a little boy lost in sin. And Jesus showed himself to me. Called me by my name and said, follow me. Hallelujah. I am, I am in love with Jesus. And for the rest of my days, I will give all I have to, to try to reimburse. I want to, I want to try to tell Jesus I love him in return. You know, John said, we love him because he first loved us. Amen. Amen. Now, let me say this before I hand over the microphone because this morning, mama will be on duty. And I know, I know you love mama more than me, but it's not a problem. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let me say something about loving the Lord. How many of you know that in the New Testament, not loving the Lord is the most grievous sin that exists in the New Testament? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22, Paul said, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, what should happen to him? Let him be accursed. Oh Lord, come. Some other, the older version says Maranatha. If anybody in the house of God does not love the Lord Jesus he is under a curse. <clears throat> and this curse is not placed by the pastor or by the man of God. God himself. So, loving Jesus is not an optional thing. Come on, touch your neighbor. Tell you, you must love the Lord Jesus. You must passionately love the Lord Jesus. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. If you read it in the literal translation of the Bible, it says, if any man does not passionately love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be, let him be cursed from now until the return of the Lord. And sometimes I tell the church, maybe that's why you are praying for breakthrough. It's not happening. Now somebody asked the question yesterday, what if you have done everything, you have done the number one thing you must do is that you must love the Lord because that is the greatest commandment in the Bible. Do you know that? The greatest of all commandments is that you will love the Lord your God. With how many of your heart? All! Amen. So I pray the Lord this morning that this congregation, all of us here, from the pulpit to the door, we all will be turned into lovers of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Not just lovers in words. You know, many of us, we just love the Lord in our words or in our worship. I love you, Lord. But when we step out of here, that's it. No, the love is just for the time we are worshiping him. In fact, it's bribery and corruption. You lie to God that you love him with all your heart. You are ready to die for him. No? But when
when he asks you to do something, you start furious, you start arguing, and you start debating. Amen. Amen. Once again, we want to say our appreciation to Pastor Fred and the leadership of this ministry. Thank you for having us in Lagos. Thank you for having reconciled me with Lagos. You know, the more, the longer I stay, the fear for Lagos is diminishing. Everybody's writing and calling from everywhere. I say, how are you coping with Lagos? I say, I'm being reconciled with the city. <laughs> and they're asking me, how about the traffic and all of that? I haven't gone out of the only road I know is from here to a hotel and hotel to here. And I don't want to know more than that. <laughs> and from there to the airport in the plane back home. Hallelujah. But we are glad. We've been glad being here. It's been a, it's been a joy serving you. Serving the Lord Jesus by serving you this weekend. Hallelujah. We literally enjoyed ourselves. Teaching morning and evening and morning and evening. You stretch us indeed. But we were glad. No, we were glad we had enough time to download. Hallelujah. It's our prayer that next time, if Jesus permits us to come back, we will find a people at another level. Like Pastor said, we want to hear the testimonies of changed lives. Even as you begin the journey tomorrow, oh, it's going to be an exciting journey. I promise you. I promise. Not I promise you it's going to be an exciting journey. You will start praying and you will not want to stop praying. Hallelujah. The Lord will visit you and the Lord will change your stories. Yes. Not, not just for now. He's not just going to give you some money for your pocket. He's going to reveal himself to you, take you up and show you the mysteries of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this morning, I want to give an opportunity to, to mom to come and greet you and maybe whatever. Hallelujah. And if there is some time left after she has greeted you, I will come back and Good morning, good morning, good morning. I bless the Lord for the opportunity to be here. And I sincerely want to say thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Pastor. You are a wonderful host. Thank you so much, Olive. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. We want to say, or I want to say, ah, uh, really blessed being here. I am challenged. You know, every time I go out and I see people that want to please the Lord, my heart leaps because I know that we are touching the heart of God. We started this journey and we were like, Father, where are you taking us to? But I can tell you, I'm enjoying life now. As a wife, as a mother, as a pastor, I'm enjoying life now as a servant of God. <laughs> Yesterday, I saw people coming out for prayers. Those who accepted to pray for 10 days and more. And I want to say the Lord will really meet you. When I got up this morning, the scripture that came to my heart was Jeremiah 29, verse 13. When I came in here, I found that the pastor was talking in the same line. If ye seek me, if ye shall seek me, no, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. When I was listening to him, I said to myself, 
there is something that is happening in this place. God is about to change the story of so many people here. And you know, he concluded oh, before going down, he just said the Lord found him in his village. He was in his village. He was not even in town. He was not in the capital city. He was in his village. He said he did not have flesh. Now he is fat. He can impress some people. But you know you can't impress God. Because God knows you. He sees you. And what he's looking for is your heart. There are things that can impress people. But God is not impressed. Yesterday I saw small children. And we wanted to inquire. Do you even understand? Are you sure that you're going to fast? Do you understand why they are giving or they are imparting you, they are greeting you with oil? Do you understand that they were coming? When you start working with God, it does not depend on the age because God can reveal himself to you even at a, at a tender age. And when the Lord is moving or doing things with his people, never think that the children are left out. There are so many people in the Bible that started walking with God or hearing his voice when they were small. And God wants to do it. Tomorrow you will embark into something else. What will happen to you is the history you will be writing with God. Yourself. Not your pastor. Yourself. And you shall seek me. You can't be in a church where they seek God to find him. And you are left behind. You can't be in a church where they pray and you can hear God for yourself. What will happen from tomorrow is that the Lord will open your ears and you will become sensitive. If at all you pray, if at all you seek him, you will start hearing him. Because I, I heard here, Somebody said, how can you hear the voice of God? It is a question that is being asked all over the world. But you as an individual, you must learn to know God for yourself. Hear God for yourself. Be determined. Ten days, before ten days, I must be able to hear God. It is your decision. Because the Lord is there ready to reveal himself. Before the end of the 10 days, Father, I want to hear you. Father, I want to see you. You should be resolute. You should know and write whatever you are expecting God to do for you. Don't just come and be walking. What do you expect God to do? Yes, we were taught here that we should not be coming here to ask for cars, for dresses, or for whatever. Father, what do I need? It's you I want. It's you I want to know. It's you. It's your face I'm looking for. You know, I like this church. When I came here, I realized that you follow the messages or the teachings in silence. And it is a good attitude. You don't just jump and shout. Because your pastor is a good teacher. He wants to make sure it enters sinks into your heart. So when you come, come with an expectation. Know that Father, I expect a miracle. If you want to be a miracle worker, if you want to be used by God, there are prerequisites. There are some things you must do or you must have 
tomorrow, why not take a new book? He said tomorrow is a new new era. Something new. Set your new goals. Even if you are in the month of April, set your new spiritual goals and say, God, this is what I want. By this time, I want to be able to hear you clearly, to see you clearly. When you work with God, it goes in stages. You may not hear or you, will, you may not fall in church and find yourself in heaven. No, no, no. You may not, but you will see and you will notice that you are becoming, you, you, you don't understand yourselves. There are things happening to you and you will be sensitive to those things. That's how you work with God. You can work with God and be conscious only of your environment, only of the flesh, how you feel. You know, every woman, because you've learned to understand your body, you know, you can explain what is happening to you at which, at which period of the month. That's how you work with God. You give him your attention. From tomorrow, for most of you, he will tell you, you go to your WhatsApp just one hour a day. Or you close the WhatsApp. You go to WhatsApp to take the information, necessary for, then you close it, come back to me. Be sensitive. You shouldn't just imitate people. You should not copy people. Hear God for yourself. You are engaging into a new school, a new way of living. It will change so many things. It will change your appetite. Because you are seeking God, you will change the way you eat. Because you are seeking God, you will change the way you talk. You will change the way you manage your program. And then you realize that that's how you should live normally. You can come to church and you hear others giving testimonies how they prayed. The Lord allowed them to pray for three hours, four hours, non-stop. And you are there, you can't pray for, for 30 minutes. From now, you keep yourself under check. is from tomorrow that everything you heard and I encourage you go back to you, your channel and be listening listen and re-listen the more you listen and the more you read you will see that you are losing some things there are things you will no more care for Sometimes you live your life according to what you read somewhere, to what people say, to what people think about you. You will close your ears to all those things. And you will discover that you are hungry for God. Sometimes you don't know what is happening to you, but you will just discover that um, you want something. I think recently I was talking with uh, Lagrande, Joseph Lagrande, and I was telling her, I don't know, I, I'm feeling like I am hungry. I, I'm feeling like I want to eat something, but I don't know. And uh, she asked me, she started asking some questions just to try to, uh, to help me to know what I really want. And I told her, I think that I'm hungry of God. Because when I try to, I try to take this, it does not fit. It does not match. It does not feel my hunger. I believe it is all the hunger for God. And that is what the Lord is going to create in you. Even when you are in the market, 
Have you ever found yourself just praying anywhere? Have you ever found yourself praying at midnight? Maybe you've never experienced it. But from tomorrow, you will experience it. You have the strength to wake up in the morning. And I can tell you, I can give you some tips. But if your heart is not there, the tips I will give you will not help. You want to pray in the night? It's hot. So just get up. Go and take a bath. And start praying. And you shall seek me. Are you a God chaser? Do you seek God? From tomorrow, I'm telling you, if you are committed to seeking the Lord for 10 days, the Lord is faithful. He will reveal himself. Amen. He said, when you shall search for me with all your heart, it starts in the heart. Everything we do, we think about it. It starts in the heart. You keep your heart. Guard your heart. More than anything. Because it is from your heart. Everything will come from your heart. You may say that you want it, but if your heart is not set for it, you won't have it. You remember this man, the, the rich man, the rich man said in his heart, and my husband used to say, that man, that young rich man was a Pentecostal. Because Pentecostal, they usually say things in the heart. And what they say does not correspond to what they think or what is in, the, in their heart. So if you are here, no matter your confession, if you don't tune your heart to seeking the Lord, say in your heart. Many a times, you find your heart telling you some things. Especially if you are young and you have some challenges, you don't know how tomorrow will be. Any, you, will, you may say, let me just go and do my things. When I'll be fine, I will come back to God. I want to tell you, don't be deceived by your heart. Hallelujah. This week, we learned what means to have Jesus as your Lord. And I can tell you, it's not something easy. That's why I say every day you learn to die. Every day you die. Die to serve. Die to whatever. To those things. And the decision is within. Nobody decides for you. You decide. The journey the Lord is embarking you to is not for the religious. It's for the lovers of God. Because the love or your love for God will take you to do things sometimes that are that may not be understood by those around you. Your love for God will take you to do some sacrifices. And for those who like um, trouble, that will say Jesus did it all. Yes, today is Resurrection Sunday. Jesus did it all. He paid the ultimate, sac ultimate sacrifice. Yes, he did. But if you love him, there are things you will do for him. If you love the Lord, there are things you will leave for him. If you love the Lord, you will talk to your heart. You will tune your heart. And you will make your life like stick to God. Let 
living with Christ is not something abstract. It's something concrete, practical, and every day people are looking at you. And the challenge is who will stand for God? Who will stand for Him? Who will speak for Him? Who will boldly speak for Him and stand for Him? When the Lord started with us, I prayed and I said, Father, I don't know how I would do. I'm a woman. How would that happen? I have things to do. I have the children. You know, we have many reasons we can give to God why we shouldn't do some things. And the Lord started telling me that I want to start with you. I want to start changing you. And I said, no, Lord. Me, it is not easy to change me. I want to change others. He said, no, I want to start changing you. I said, Lord, I will not have time. Me, I will not have time to pray because I have children. I will not have time to pray. I have to take care of my home. I will not have time to pray because I have to take care of my husband. Father, it's so difficult. When I go, I go lie down in the evening, I am so tired. What will I do? He said, I want to start with you. You must pray. And I learned. I learned to go to the hospital give birth to my baby next Friday I take my baby to church I put him at the altar or her at the altar and I start praying I said father allow me teach me teach me how to put you in every section of my life father teach me how can I do He said, I will take you by the hand. I will go with you. And I learned. I learned that I should not spare them. I should take them. They, they learned to sleep even in the midst of noise. They learned to pray. I learned to pray with them. I learned to fast with them. And you know the children. I learned to give them the, the boldness to introduce themselves as pastor's kids. I taught them to die. You know when you go to school, everybody will say, and I know it happens everywhere. My father is an engineer. My father is a doctor. My father is, my father is, and when you say my father is a pastor, they will laugh at you. They were laughing at them. Your father is a pastor. So you are living of offerings. So your father is stealing the uh -huh. your, father, your mother your mother is stealing money from the offertory to cook for you that's what they were telling them and when they will come back they will start crying because their father is a pastor we had to walk and change that I learned how to make discipleship in my house we had to sit and listen to them they were ashamed. Daddy, why aren't you what? Maybe an engineer, maybe a banker, maybe a... why are you pastor? They are laughing at us. These are practical things. 
and I want to see the kingdom of God, of God come into my house. And the Lord said, start walking in your house. I want my kingdom in your house. I want disciples in your house. And I said, it is not easy. We taught them sacrifice. I remember when it was to be consecrated, right? As apostle. They wanted testimonies. We had a conclave. And people were asked to come and testify. If he is fit to be an apostle, they will check your family. And I want to tell you, if you are here, you want to go and win the whole world, please start with your family. It is in your family that you will make disciples that will stay that will remain grounded in God. Because sometimes you know people that are coming from everywhere, you don't know where they are coming from. But here, you are coming from my loins, I will pray, I started praying for you, and I will pray, you come out, I pray, you are a baby, I pray, you grow, I pray. So in the conclave, they ask, People to come and testify. And it is Lagrande that testified that day, that came and spoke. And she said, I remember when we were still small, that he would take the money, all the money, and pay the school fees for other people. And sometimes our school was not yet paid. I remember we've learned to live with people. We learned to sacrifice. People will come and we have to give them food when it is not enough for us. And she concluded by saying, but we thank God because things did not remain like that. Things change and we learned. There is no excuse for your children not to follow your God. You must work. You must bring them into it. I said to myself and I usually tell my husband, I don't, I don't care if I don't stand before 10,000 people to talk to them, to preach. I have an audience. And I want to tell you, parents, brothers, sisters, you have audience. You have an audience. People living with you, you have an audience. You can make an impact. I said to myself, Father, where I cannot go, I want them to go. And I took time. I prayed. When she said it, I said to myself, oh, I remember at a time we were living with people. My, uh, how do they call the, the, the helper in the house? A house, house, housemaid, right? She came and I received her in my house with her children. She will, she will cry when the school will resume. She will be crying. I want to go to the same school with them. I want this with them. How do I have this and they don't have? And I started telling myself, okay, this thing is taking, it's picking. It means she's conscious. She has understood. I prayed, I said, God, I don't want to be cast away. I don't want my family to be cast away. You know this thing, Christianity, I believe Christianity is not, it's not, it's a way of life. It's living Christ every day. That's why I don't understand how somebody can come to church. It's, 
A and when he goes out, he becomes B. You want people that will test you? Your household will test you. Your children will test you. They are looking at you. They are watching you. They want to see if what you say is in accordance with what you think or what you live. So, from tomorrow, we are entering a new era. And that new era is not for you alone. That new era is for people around you. They will be watching. They will be looking at you. What is the change that has happened? in my life. If you live a life without change with God, it means that something is wrong. You can't be with God and your life is not changed. You can't be with God and your life is stagnant. You can't be with God and you cannot assess yourself and see that there is some growth and you are normal. No. There should be some growth. There should be some growth around you. There should be some growth in you. There should be some growth in the way you minister to people. When I think, or I think one of the things, one of the ways God is um, dealing with his children is in our, the way we behave. There are things or there are areas in our lives where we've said God can no more do. God cannot change us here. God cannot change me here. But when God starts dealing with you, he will go and revive or like open the wounds in those areas. Until he has finished with you, he will not let you. For example, anger. You are good until somebody touches you. And this period, the Lord would deal with that. There are things like over-talking, talkative. You have to comment on everything. When the Lord starts dealing with it, it will start dealing with you. Sometimes he will tell you, you fast. You don't talk. Today, I don't want you to talk. I did not know it, 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 it could be done. I did not know until I saw somebody say, I'm fasting. Uh, I will not be talking today. I will not be talking. I say, but you are fasting. I, I thought you were just fasting food. No, 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 no. Today, I'm not talking. And you know when you are talkative, you want to comment on everything. You want to shout. You want to, especially when you are a mother. And the Lord dealt with me on that. You know when the children are small, you have arranged your house, you want your house to be clean, you want every, and then you are coming from afar. Oh my God, I will see. They forgot to close the, to close the, the, the gate. I will see that the TV is on. When I was leaving the house, the TV was not on. When, when they would open the gate, my heart would just be like, I don't know. I want to talk. I want to shout. You people, you want to kill me in this house. You will not kill me. I'm telling you. Uh. So when I would go and sit down, and he will ask me, must you talk? Then I will go and repent. I say, Father, teach me. Small areas like that, that are staining your testimony or the testimony of the Lord, the Lord will be dealing with you. Because here we spoke about mammon, idolatry. When you start, he will start showing you what is happening in your heart. He will show himself to you if you seek him with all your heart. The Lord is looking at your heart. If you are thirsty for him, he will reveal himself. You are my, you are my friend if you do that which I command you. And the Lord is looking for somebody like that. And my prayer 
is that you don't just hear general testimonies or the testimonies of others. My prayer is that you will have your own testimony. Amen. The pastor said here that if there is nothing, we are not coming back. Well, he's talking, let him be talking for him because I know he will be praying for you. But you decide to write your name in the list of all those that have a testimony with God. Those that have an encounter with God. Those that have seen their lives being completely changed. It is my desire. And that's the word of encouragement I wanted to bring to you this morning. As a person, write your name. As a person, open your heart to God and let him do. All those things you've been hearing others testify about. Amen. Can you just put your heart in your, your hand in on your heart and pray, Father, change my heart. Set my heart on you. Change my appetite. Give me a testimony. A testimony for life. I want to be another person. A changed person. I want to experience you. In Jesus name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. And I want to say thank you to my husband. I want to tell you your pastor is right. The Lord has given me a gift. He gave himself to me and given me this gift that is taking me to the Lord. Amen. Uh, I gave him four children. Forget about that. He's taking me all over the world. Forget about that. But he's showing me the way to the Father. And I thank God for it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you for that. Do you see have space so we can put more? Yes, sir. Sure. Yes, <laughs> Today is the last day, the great day of the feast, right? Yes, and Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come. Hallelujah. Yesterday, I promised you that I, I was going to teach you some things. I want to teach you three things quickly before we go to the table of the ark. I can't wait to do communion this morning. I've been seeing this table here and I'm asking myself, is it a new church decoration or is communion first? In our church, we do communion every time we meet. I mean, almost every, every meeting, we, we don't leave without breaking bread. Hallelujah. Now, see, uh, let me... See. When you notice the progressions of my different raptures, did you notice that from the first rapture to the second rapture to the third and the fourth, there was a progression? In the first rapture, when the Lord took me to heaven the first time, and there was an angel, there was a staircase, we got in front of a closed door, the angel got closed, the door opened, we entered. You know, second time, he reduced the items. You know, he, the angel was not there, there was no staircase, the door was half open. The third time, you know why? When God begins to initiate you into the supernatural or into the life of God, because when we talk about, when I mention the supernatural here, I'm talking about the life of God. Paul said to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. Look at that for me. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened and be what? From what? Be alienated or be strangers to the life of God, from the life of God. So what Paul is saying here is that the Gentiles do not know 
what the life of God is. It means in basic English that what the Gentiles call life is not the life of God. And what do the Gentiles call life? Huh? What do the Gentiles call life? When you have wealth, it means you no. Know? What else? We well, have position. We have power. Fame. No. When you eat well, you are well dressed. The gentle call this life. This is enjoying life. No. But God, Paul is saying that the Gentiles are alienated from the life of God or they are strangers to the life of God. It means the life of God has nothing to do wearing a nice dress, driving a beautiful car. Okay? So the life of God is something all, something different altogether. Yes, we will be doing this, but this is not the life of God. Though. It does Thank God for the beautiful God that is bringing me to church back and forth, right? But that's not the life of God. Because as we drive, other Gentiles are driving even better cars than the one we drive. No? So that's not the life of God. If you fly private jet or business class or whatever not, you go VIP lunch and then you go to the president and meet the president, drink tea with him. That is not the life of God. The life of God is something completely different from that. So, when God begins to initiate you to the realms of the supernatural, or he's taking you, he's beginning to initiate you to what we call the life of God. See, walk in the spirit. Walking in the spirit is walking in the life of God. The life of God is not the life of this world, this material life. We use the material things because we are still here. But you see, from the day you got born again, listen to this keenly, Olive, the day you got born again, you became a heavenly entity living on the earth. You became what? You are not an Igbo man, you are not a Yoruba, you are not Ausa, you are not all this, you are not that. You are heavenly, you became, from the day you said yes to Jesus, you became a heavenly entity. A heavenly body that is living here and this home this world is not our home Jesus said my kingdom is not of this world that's why you must not have attachment to this world attached to your car attached to your house attached to your husband attached to your dog to your cat to your money to whatever no no attachment and you must live in this world knowing you are on transit the transit may last a hundred years but you are permanently oh come on somebody talk to me you are what permanently on transit the day you settle you have disactivated your heavenly citizenship and many people that come to church have disactivated their heavenly citizenship when you see your life, you see yourself only here. When you invest in your life, you invest only on the things that are here. So when God began to, to initiate me to, or when God began to initiate you to the life of God, he will take you gradually, he will take you step by step. He doesn't start on the first day and take you to the university. No, he will start from kindergarten. He will take, you do first step, second step, like I said yesterday, when the angel, when the river came out of the altar and was flowing and the angel came, he measured a thousand cubit. Ezekiel followed him, right? And he had water at the ankle, ankle level. Then he measured another thousand cubit. Ezekiel followed and the river was knee level. And then he measured another. Now, see, you must be willing to did you notice in that scripture, Ezekiel 47, the angel didn't say to Ezekiel, follow me. Uh oh. He just measured and it is Ezekiel that took the initiative to follow. So you must be willing to follow. Hallelujah. 
When he measured a thousand cubit, Ezekiel followed. He measured another thousand. Now, the angel could have measured four thousand cubit at once. No, God wouldn't do that. Because he wants to take you gradually, step by step. Hallelujah. See, even Jesus, the Bible says of Jesus that he grew. And the child grew. When Jesus began to experience the supernatural power of God, he did not start by raising Lazarus from the dead. When you see the accounts of the resurrection that Jesus performed in the Gospels, he went step by step, level from one level to another. No? The first account of resurrection is the resurrection of the widow, the, 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 the daughter of Jairus, right? The baby had just died. The body was still in the house. And Jesus came in and raised her from the dead. Then the people said, well, are you really sure that this girl was dead, like dead? Which doctor checked and declared the child clinically dead? So Jesus said, no problem. The second resurrection that is recounted in the scripture is the resurrection of the son, the, the, the son of the widow of, of Nain, right? This one now was dead. And doctors had had time to certify that the child is clinically dead. They had done all the service, the funeral service. They had dug the grave. They were almost at the cemetery when Jesus appeared. Raised the child from the dead. And then the critic says, well, maybe, but we are not too sure. So the last resurrection is the Lazar resurrection of Lazarus. They call Jesus, Lazarus, your friend, the one you love is very sick. Jesus said, leave him to die. And then they call, your friend has just died. If you don't come now, Jesus said, let him get rotten. That now, Lazarus is true, true dead. True. <laughs> no. So he appeared on the fourth day. After that, Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. Oh, I love Jesus. See, when he appeared, to raise somebody who has died for this. He's already rotten in the grave. <laughs> the prayer is just one sentence. This is a resurrection prayer or one sentence. When he got there, he said, where have you laid him? They say he's here. And Jesus said, roll the stone. Martha, Martha who was crying that, hey, my brother. Martha said, no, he's already stinking, please. Jesus said, have I not told you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And Jesus stood there and he said, Father, I did not need to pray to do this. But because of these people that are watching me, so that they know it's not me, but you, Lazarus, come forth. Ah! Now prayer for resurrection, that too. Lazarus, come forth. If it was us, no. Even Duncan William cannot pray in tongues like that. You will be here, the tongues in capital letter, cut. Uh, capital letters. Hallelujah. No, you see, those who are close to God, when they pray, you 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 know that they are close to God. When somebody is not close to God, when he prays, you can also tell. This person is not close to God. Why? Prayer, before being a means for asking God for things, is first and foremost a means of getting us close or in contact with God. Okay? Now see, I just got to meet your pastors. I don't, we, we haven't, we don't have a, a long relationship. No. By the way, I, I, I accept the friendship. We, we love the spirit in this church. We love the lovers of God. 
and we have found in your pastors genuine lovers of God I told you yesterday evening we carefully choose our company see we can preach for you without being your friends so we come and preach because we want to discharge ourselves from the duty that Jesus said. if Jesus said go and preach if we come here and we find out well these people they, they are just doing church you know some people are just doing church but they don't love God and you can't be my friend if you are not going the same direction with me and I found one that loves Jesus like me that speaks my language that is of my tribe hallelujah now see when you meet when you hear somebody praying you can tell if he is close to God or not when you don't know someone you have you don't have a very close relationship with somebody imagine me coming to Lagos now now I'm Pastor Fred's friend it's different but imagine that before I knew him or before I came here if I found myself stranded in Lagos for some reason, imagine that I came here and for some reason something happened to me and I'm stranded. I don't know how to go back to Cameroon or, you know, I need some maybe financial assistance. If I need to call, I needed to call him to ask him for money, it would be embarrassing, right? You say, oh, Pastor Fred, how are you? You remember me? This is Apostle Nyango. We met in, you know, so, uh, how is your wife? How is Olive? How are the children? Uh, oh, after, you know, all of these greetings like this is trying to you want to go to the no it's because him and i are not very close but if he's someone that is close to me i'll just pick my phone and say hey bro where are you i need a hundred thousand naira now i drop the phone true i don't even want to tell him why i need a hundred if i went if i drop the phone he will be the one looking for how do i he will call me back and say bro where are you how can i help what is the problem you know, I don't have to explain to him that, you know, I came to Lagos two days ago. I was traveling to go and see so, so. That's what prayer does for us. Prayer, before being, before it brings you to the place where you can ask things from God, it first puts you in connection with God. When somebody prays, when you hear him, Lord, my God, my Father, everlasting, almighty, redeemer, savior, divine, he's trying to look for a way He's, he's a million miles away. He's trying to come close. See, Jesus stood there. He said, I didn't need to pray. Oh. Even though this guy is rotten, I didn't need to pray. Just so that these people that are looking at me know that it's you. That's ours. Simple prayer. You know why? Because the real prayer has been done in the secret place. No? What happens in the public is the overflow of what has happened in the secret place. So if you don't have a secret life with God, you don't have a relationship with God. Your relationship with God is measured by your secret life with God. Am I talking to somebody? So when we want to measure your relationship with God, what do we need to check? is what you do in secret with God. Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 1. Can you give that for me? Give that to me. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of what? The mysteries of God. A steward is who? A keeper of the mysteries. It means that if you are a minister of God, God must entrust to you the mysteries of his kingdom. If you have no mystery of Christ, you are not his minister. May men so account of us as the as of the ministers of Christ and stewards, custodians of the mysteries of God. Look at this image. Little David 
skipping the father's sheep in the bush, right? And one morning, David killed a lion with his naked hands. David killed a lion that day and went home as if nothing happened. That day was like an ordinary day. This boy, 16 years old, just killed a, a lion with his empty hand. No stone, no sword with his hand. Pursued the lion, arrested the lion, tore the lion in pieces. We're talking about the mysteries of God. God was training David in the back. When you read Psalm 144, verse 1 and 2, he says, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands to battle and my fingers to do war. God was training David. When he killed a lion, God said, Shh, it's not a topic of discussion. This is between you and me. Mystery number one in the pocket. David finished killing the lion, washed his hand, dusted his shirt, and came home. That evening, they sat around the table. They ate the meal normally. His father, brother, nobody knew that David had ever killed a lion. Two weeks after that, he killed a bear. And God says, this is between you and me. Keep that for you, okay? You know what I'm explaining to you? I'm explaining to you what is going to start happening to you after, from tomorrow. God would embark you on a journey where he would begin to disclose and entrust his mysteries to you. See, he will give them to you and he will tell you, keep them between you and me because it is for a time and a time and half a time. See, if you don't have such mysteries, you are just a pastor. You are just reading. See, it's King James Bible you are reading and we all are reading the same King James. What makes you a minister of Christ is the amount of mysteries he has given to you. So he gave that to David. He said, David, keep it. Shh. Don't tell nobody. It's for a time, a time, and half a time. You know, like he would say, seal this oracle and keep it. It's not for now. So we are all working together, but I know something about him that you don't know. I have seen something about him that you haven't seen. See, he took Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration, right? They saw his glory. They saw him conversing with Moses and Elijah. When they finished, he told them, hey, if I hear you discussing this with Thomas and Andrew and Bartholomew, when they came back, eh, they, Jesus was with the twelve. Peter, James, and John, when they look at themselves, they know something about Jesus that the others don't know. See, it is Peter, James, and John that know that Jesus can pray until his sweat becomes blood. The others don't know that. So, we are all sitting in this church this morning. We are not all at the same level of information. Huh? No, it's not the same class. See, he said to, to Miriam and Aaron, even among the prophets, there are prophets. He says, Why are you not afraid to talk to Moses like this? To other prophets, I speak to them in dreams and visions. This is the only one to whom I speak to face to face and mouth to mouth. And you didn't fear to talk to him carelessly. So, even God makes a difference between prophets. He says, the prophets are in categories. The prophets that receive word of knowledge and word of wisdom, that's fine. They can call your telephone number and tell your village name and tell your village, whatever not. It's okay. You know, receiving a word of knowledge is like this. Leave you a message in your, a voice message. Or they leave you a message on your answering machine. You are not connected when you open your phone the message pops up. But with Moses, when he wants to talk to Moses, he doesn't leave him a voice message. He doesn't send an SMS. He comes himself. 
there are levels and levels but see he will start training you from one level to another the journey will begin slowly and the river will get deeper see mama every time he measured it was the same measurement but not the same depth huh? each time it was the same measure he used but not the same depth it was a thousand cubit each time but each time he measured thank you each time he measured the river god deeper are you with me are you with me so please you must be willing to follow that's what i'm saying like pastor said i'm saying that to, to buttress the fact that he said if after the 10 days god said continue another 10 days he has just measured another thousand cubit and if you do 20 days he said another 10 days you must be willing. If you stop following, he will stop measuring. If you do what? If you stop following, he will stop measuring. So you must be willing to keep following. Somebody say amen. Yeah. So I want to show you the three greatest enemies to the glory of God. The three things that will stop you from seeing the glory of God. And after I showed that, I will also show you the three things you need to do if you want to see the glory. Are you with me? Huh? See, I told you here, in that period of the five years when we were fasting and praying like mad people, one day the Lord said, I want you to separate from the people. Did I say it yesterday? 40 days and 40 nights. Lock yourself up. Don't even see the sun for 40 days, 40 nights. Be alone in this closet. You and me. I want to talk to you. So I left the church. I told the church for 40 days, I'm not going to be here, but continue the journey. They continued to pray. They will come to church morning, afternoon, evening, and night to pray. I was in the closet. The only people that I saw during those 40 days was my wife and my children. So I started fasting. 40 days and 40 nights. Locked up in my room. I remember the 25th day, mama. I was as good as dead. You have, if you haven't eaten and you haven't drunk for 25 days, you know there is almost no life left in you. On the 25th day, every day when my children came back from school, mommy would bring them to, to, my, to the closet so they can see me. And because they, they kept asking, where's daddy? We want to see daddy. So they would come, greet me, and make sure I'm fine, and then they would go. On that day, 25th day of those 40 days, there was no strength, no life, nothing left in me. I was lying on the floor. You know, I could not even lift up my hand. You know, just, would I, you know at that time, you are not praying loud, though. It's just praying your heart. You know, you, can't, you, just, you know, you're praying. You are not even hearing yourself. It's in your heart, everything. So they came from school, and, you know, my second daughter, the follower, the one that comes after La Grande, she loves her daddy. She loves petting. She wants when she comes, she wants to fall on me. She wants me to carry her. She wants me to. I don't have strength. So she's talking to me, and I'm talking back. She's not hearing my voice. I have no strength. She wants me to get up. I cannot get up. And then she started crying. Daddy, is Jesus wicked? <laughs> she was literally like this. Daddy, is Jesus wicked? I said, no. I said, why? She said, why is he doing this to you? I said, Jesus is not doing something to me. Your daddy is hungry for God. I'm seeking God, my daughter. And she's crying. And I, I'm talking to her now. I'm crying too, you know. Like, her tears provoke my own. So we are, the two of us are crying. And I, I told mommy, please take them out. I don't want, I will see them only when I finish. Because if she keeps asking me this question, I will be tempted to do something that I'm not supposed to do. So, mommy took them out of the room. And the moment they left, I locked the, she locked the room from outside. And then the Lord began to, began to talk to me. He said to me, there are three things that you, will stop you from seeing the glory of God. Number one, enemy. Excess eating and drinking. If you linger around the table and around the activities that are done around the table, 
you disqualify yourself from the glory of God. <clears throat> if you eat three meals a day, say goodbye to glory or you will never see it. You only hear it in preaching and in songs, but you will never experience it. Luke 30, 30, 21 verse 34. Look at that scripture. Be careful or your hearts will, weigh, will be weighed down with what? Dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And what will happen? Which day is he talking about? He's talking about the day of the Lord. And now here, the idea is a rapture, right? But he's talking about, he's not only, he's, yes, long term he's talking about rapture. But when he's talking about the day of the Lord, he's talking about what the dealings of God with you will pass you by because you are wasting time. Your heart is weighed down with too much drinking and eating. So I ask the Lord, when we eat food, does it go to the stomach or does it, does it go to the heart? And he told me there is a direct connection between your stomach and your heart. When your heart, when your stomach is full, it draws your heart down. Hallelujah. So, see, since April 2012, except for special, special occasions, we only eat one meal a day. Enough to keep, keep our body strong. So we can give ourselves to prayer. If you spend time around the table, if you do not crucify King Stomach, you are not ready for the glory. That day he told me, see, except you get to the place where purpose is stronger than pleasure, you are not ready for the next level. One day he got to the well in Samaria and Jesus sent 12 of his disciples, 12 men, 12, can you imagine 12 men like me sent to the bakery to go and buy bread? Where well, they going to buy the whole bakery? And all of them left. They left Jesus alone. 12 of them went to the bakery. They bought bread. They ate their own and they kept a, a portion for Jesus. When they got back to the well, they proposed the bread to Jesus. Say, "Oh, we kept for you. We kept some for you." And he said to them, "I am eating another food that you know not about." And they were not curious to ask him what kind of food. Their minds were in the bread they brought. The moment Jesus said, "No, I'm not eating this bread because I have another food," they all quickly jumped back and they were fighting, struggling, scrambling over the little the bread that they brought for Jesus. The disciples of Jesus were given to eating and drinking. In fact, they would eat so much that sometimes they forget even to wash their hands. Remember? But their master was a man given to prayer and fasting. Jesus was a very sober person, you know that. When his disciples were eating, Jesus wasn't eating. That's why they came to accuse them to Jesus. When the disciples of Jesus could not cast out the devil in this lunatic guy, remember what they said? They asked Jesus, why couldn't we cast out this devil? And Jesus said, you couldn't cast out the devil, number one, because your feet is small. But more importantly, this guy, go at not. By what? Prayer and fasting, it means there are levels of authority in God you cannot command if you are if you spend your time eating. There are levels of authority. There are levels of power. There are dimensions of glory you will not access if you are not a man given to prayer and fasting. It means you cannot access that realm if you do not reduce your intake of food and drink. Am I talking to somebody? So King Stomach, 
Now, how many of you know that you can decide? Now, I'm saying this so that it helps you from tomorrow. Some days, I know you Lagos people, you are very busy when you go out, long day, no, hustle. In Lagos, everybody's, even driving, you have to be, you have to have some. The way my driver hunts, now you know he's a military man. Bam, 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 bam. Life is fast, right? Sometimes you get too busy, you can stay the whole day without eating until maybe late in the afternoon. When you start getting a little dizzy or your head starts aching a little bit, then you realize, oh, I haven't even eaten something, right? So you can stay almost a whole day without eating like till late afternoon. But when now you decide tomorrow I am going to fast, by nine o'clock you are seeing stars. You are trembling like this. It's like your heart will stop pounding. Who knows what I'm talking about? You, you know why? When you declare officially that you are going to fast, you are waging war against King Stomach. Before 10 o'clock, he wants you to pay your dues. And sometimes he will persecute you so hard, you will go and drink something and eat something that he leaves you alone. But when you, don't, when you didn't officially or formally declare that you are going to fast, you can stay till 4 o'clock, even 5. Not, and not, you know, because fasting is waging war against a God called King Stomach. So if you want to walk in the spirit, you must crucify King Stomach. You must be able to see food, the nice food that you like, and tell the food, I will not eat you. Huh? Don't fast because there's no food. Don't fast when the food is there. You look at the food and say, I like you. You smell good, but I'm not going to eat you. Because I'm giving myself to something better. That's how you start dominating King Stomach. That's how you start walking in the spirit. He said, walk in the spirit and you will not do what? The desires of the flesh. The flesh wants to eat. Oh, you think Eba is not good enough? It's, it's good in everybody's mouth. Okra is good. Fish, when it's roasted, well roasted, is good in everybody's mouth. Huh? But when you are, have acquired the discipline, the money is there, the food is there, but you are not eating it because you are going somewhere that is better. Jesus said, I'm eating another food that you know not about. Are you with me? So, number one enemy is what? Excess. So, do not linger around the table. It's not good for you. Huh? If you linger around the table, you will cut yourself short from the glory of God. Enemy number two. Excess sleep. If you love the bed and activities that are done around the bed, I like your smile. It means you got what I said. If you love the bed and the activities done around the bed, you will cut yourself from the glory of God. And especially for the pastors that are here. Pastor, if you go to bed at 10 p.m. and you sleep through till 6 a.m. in the morning, you need deliverance. You are bewitched. You are what? Oh, you need help. Any shepherd that sleep at the same time with his sheep is not a shepherd. The real shepherds stay awake when they are sheep are sleeping. When Jesus was born, the Bible said there was in that country some shepherds that stayed awake in the watches of the night to watch over their flock. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of God shone around them. They were scared and the angel said to them, do not be afraid for I bring to you good news that will be for all the people that's risen for great rejoicing. It is today in the city of David. A savior is born to you. 
it is the, the shepherds that were awake in the night that saw the angel it is the shepherds that were awake in the night that received the message from heaven those that were awake those that were asleep they were informed only in the morning how many of you know that that God's day begin in the night everything that is done in the day is decided over in the night when you read Genesis chapter 1 and 2 the Bible said there was an evening and then a morning the first day so the first day started in the evening before the morning those who are awake in the night rule the day those who are what they do what they rule the day Our master, the Bible said the disciple is not greater than his, his master. Every perfect disciple must be like the master. Our master, the Bible said every night when it was yet dark, he will do what? Go to a solitary place to pray. Paul and Silas, they were arrested, beaten and jailed and put in the dungeon of the prison. Right? Acts chapter 16, the Bible says, and about midnight, when they got close to midnight, Paul tapped Silas, he said, guy, wake up, it's time to pray. My question is, why didn't he ask him to pray at 9 p.m.? Because there are hours in the night that are called hours of decision. Those hours, serious people are awake to do serious business. It's an hour for serious transaction. There are hours where heaven opens its gates to transact with the earth. Huh? See, Elijah and the, 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 the prophets of Baal on, the, on Mount Carmel, he gave them the whole day. Huh? From all, he said, you have the day, go ahead. They cried, they shouted until the hour of the evening sacrifice. So if you want to go some places to, with God, you must, re, dip, you must reduce your hours of sleep. When next I come, by the grace of God, we're going to teach you how to observe the prayer watches. Huh? So Paul and Silas was at our midnight. They began to pray. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. Because they know that is the time heaven is doing transactions with the earth. Hallelujah. So if you give yourself too much sleep, poverty will fall on you. It's not just financial poverty. Even spiritual poverty. Hallelujah. Look at Isaiah 56 verse 10 and 11. His watchmen, talking about the shepherds of Israel, they are what? They are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot back. Why? Uh huh. Yes. Now so, if you are a shepherd and you love, yes, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Everyone for his gain from his quarter. Why? Because they love to sleep, they love to slumber, and they are all lying down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, sleep is a robber. Tell your neighbor, sleep is, sleep is a robber. Tell another neighbor, sleep is a robber. He said, if you give yourself a little sleep and a little slumber, poverty will come on you like a robber or like an armed robber. Jesus took his, his best friends, Peter, James, and John, to the Mount 
of transfiguration. Now listen to this because it's important. I told you yesterday, we read Leviticus chapter 9 verse 6, right? And Moses said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. If you do what the Lord has commanded, what will happen to you? The glory of the Lord will appear unto you. If you do not do what the Lord has commanded, the glory of the Lord will not appear. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus told his best friends, Peter, James, and John, come with me and let us go to the mountain to go and pray. The instruction was to go and do what? Go and pray. We are in Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 28. When they got to the mountain, the Bible said, why he prayed? And it came to pass about an eight days. Yes, I was reading. And it came to pass at a, a, about an eight days after this saying, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. They were going to the mountain to pray. And the Bible said, as he prayed. Normally they should have said, as they prayed. No, as he prayed. One person prayed. What were the others doing? They were fast asleep. As he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. You know the story, right? We're talking about transfiguration. Now what is Peter, James, and John doing? They are sleeping. Sleep. Now, how many of you believe like me that Jesus knew the transfiguration was going to take place? Is there anybody that believed like me that Jesus knew that he was taking them to the Mount of Transfiguration? That he had an appointment with destiny? Huh? Now, when he asked them to come and pray with him, this is me, I believe. Jesus wanted his three disciples, his best friends, to enter in the glory with him. He did not bring them so that they can be actors. Uh, no, spectators. He wanted them to be actors with him. Because he told them to go and pray. Now, the thing that two things trigger transfiguration or the glory. Number one, the mountain. Because Jesus could have taken them to a room just in the house. He said, let's go into the room here. No, he had to take them to the mountain. Number two, they had to pray. They went up to the Mount of Transfiguration at the hour of transfiguration and they missed the transfiguration. Why? You will do what the Lord has commanded and the glory of the Lord will appear unto you. If you do not do what the Lord has commanded, the glory will not appear. See, when they got to the mountain, there were four of them. It's only one person who prayed. It is the only person who prayed that was transfigured. The three others that did not pray, they were there where it was happening and it didn't touch them. When the glory came, it, it, dropped, it dodged Peter, dodged John and dodged James. And only went to Jesus. Sleep robbed them from the experience of the glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Are you with me? And Jesus said, it's not a problem. I know what to do. I'm going to give them a second chance. When he was going to get some money to enter his passion. Now Jesus is going to enter. This is the last, the last Blow, Jesus wants to give to the kingdom of darkness. He takes the three, his three best friends, the same guys. He said, come with me. They went to the mount. The same robber stole the opportunity. See, up until now, Peter, James, and John, we, they lost the, the privilege of learning how to pray and make your sweat become blood. Because of sleep. Jesus told them, could you not even watch one hour? Sleep robbed them from the privilege of entering the passion with the Messiah. Hallelujah. So if you give sleep to your, too much sleep to your eyes, did I say you shouldn't sleep at all? No. But what I'm saying is you must reduce. Somebody said, if you sleep, your life will sleep. In fact, if you sleep, your life will snore. You must wake up or you must. Life is for those who are awake. Hallelujah. So the second enemy is called what? Sleep. Excess sleep. 
It's not just sleep, it's excess sleep. And some of you, you sleep, or you don't even have a good bed. But you're... Hallelujah. Now, number three enemy. Oh. The dead enemy to the glory of God is called familiarity. It's called what? The day you become familiar to God and to the things of God, you will cut off, you will disconnect yourself from the glory of God. complacency and familiarity are two killers of the glory in your life. See, the day you become familiar to God, you lose reverence for God and for the things of God. You stop trembling at the word of God. You know, for so many of us, God has become a cousin. No? No? The house of God is just one of those places that we go to. It's like, it's not, this is a, but see, it doesn't matter how big you are in the faith, we must keep a, a reverence for God and for the things of God. Now, do you know Moses, Miriam, and Aaron? Huh? You know they are the parents, they're the children of the same parents, right? And Moses was the youngest. It is Moses that God called to minister in that family. You know that? The day God called Moses, we saw it yesterday, Moses began, became a stammerer. It is Moses that mentioned Aaron's name. Lord, if you are looking for someone that can talk, I will propose my elder brother. He's tall like this. He is very eloquent. That guy can talk. Oh my God. That guy can talk. God said, if you need somebody to talk for you, I will hire him. But he's not going to work for me. He's going to work for you. So Aaron became a prophet by power of attorney. Huh? It is Moses that made God to hire Aaron. And Aaron climbed the ladder of priesthood until he became chief high priest. He became the chief high priest by power of attorney. It is his connection to Moses that gave him access to priesthood. No? Somehow in the scriptures, suddenly we discover Miriam too is now a prophetess. When you search in the scripture, you don't see any place where God called Miriam. And I believe it's the same power of attorney. It's her connection to Moses that caused the anointing to rub off on her. And now she's manifesting some level of grace. And then one day, Miriam and Aaron forgot that it was because of Moses. Now Moses married this woman and his senior brothers are not happy. So they summoned Moses saying, Momo, come here. Now they're calling him the, the pet name that they call him at home. Uh, now we are not talking to the man of God. We are talking to you. You see me like see Miriam. Eh? Miriam is like Moses' mother. You know that when the when the mother went and dropped Moses in the river, it's Miriam that stood there. When the, the, the princess came, it is Miriam that said, "I know a woman that can help you take care of this child." And she ran and called Moses' mother. So she will tell you she was elderly. Compared to Moses, she was already of a certain age. So Moses is regarding them as parents. So they said, come here. It's not because we call you the senior pastor. This thing that you did. In fact, they were talking to Moses like this. God's anger kindled. God was so angry. Like, who gave you the right to talk to Moses? Aaron and Miriam, you're talking to Moses. You talking to Moses like this? God was so angry. Moses was trying to calm God's anger. Please God. God said, Leave, get out of my way. Let me deal with these two people. On that day, Miriam was covered with leprosy. Moses said, put her out of the camp. 
she's going to stay out of the camp for seven days. You know, God struck Miriam that day on the spot. But he didn't touch Aaron. You know why he didn't touch Aaron? Because Aaron was wearing his priesthood garment. That priesthood garment like that is immunity. God couldn't deal with Aaron on the spot because he was covered. See, Miriam was struck with leprosy and put out of the camp for seven days. When Miriam came back after the seven days, eh, she, would never, she never prophesied anymore. And shortly after that, she died. You know, sometimes, listen to me keenly, we get too familiar, even with our pastors. The Bible says, touch not. Huh? Do what? Touch not my anointed. See, in this matter, David had a good lesson to teach all of us. Now, I know, when you mention this in most churches, they will say, yes, you are talking about like that so that you give more power to pastors. No. David's pastor, Saul, is now demon-possessed. In fact, he's mad. He has not just backslidden, no, he's mad. He's demon possessed. David has to come and play music to calm David's de Saul's demons. But David will never lift his finger against Saul. True? See, Saul attempted so many times to kill David. Threw his sword at David to kill him. David will escape. But David will not go out there and make a comment. He said, far be it from me to touch the anointed of the Lord. Oh, not the church now. Hey, the pastor has not even touched you. Just that he made a preaching roster, he didn't put your name. You, the comment that you will hear, David says, it's not me. Oh. Until the death of Saul, in fact, the one that came to announce death, Saul's death to David, what did he do to him? He killed him. I mean, you are rejoicing that the Lord's anointed is dead. This Lord's anointed like this demon-possessed king. But David will not touch him. That's how you preserve the oil of God on your life. Because the day you touch the anointed of the Lord, what happens to you? You die, God will touch you. See, Miriam died. But Aaron was not touched. Now, you know why God didn't touch Aaron immediately? Because Moses was so sad for the passing away of, of Miriam. So, God said, for the sake of Moses, I will leave Aaron. But the day the two of them gung up to attack Moses, you know what God did? He had signed, it's finished. Even you, finish. When Moses was now comforted, has forgotten the death of Miriam. One morning, God said to Moses, Hey, can you come up to the mountain? Please bring Aaron with you. So he took Aaron and they went to the mountain. When they got to the mountain, God said to Moses, Please, can you remove his priestly garment? I want to show you something. And I'm sure in Moses' mind, surely God wants to upgrade Aaron. Or I want to promote him. Moses removed his garments. When he finished removing, God said, take two steps behind. The moment he shifted that, that before he knew it, bang, God killed Aaron. Finish. If you touch the Lord's anointed, the day you become familiar with God and with the things of God, you get disconnected from the glory of God. See, in Babylon, eh? God divided a whole empire because of a glass. Ordinary glass. Oh. True? These were vessels that were consecrated and put in the sanctuary in Jerusalem. When Nebuchadnezzar deported the Jews, he entered the house of God and two holy vessels and took them to Babylon. As long as they kept them in Babylon, God didn't punish them. And one day, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, decided to drink in this cup. 
That's what brought the many, many take care of us. The finger of God appeared, divided the king, touch holy vessels. The day you play, you become familiar with God and the things of God. What do you bring upon yourself? Church me. Hallelujah. So let me let me let me give you a good advice. Eh? Please save yourself from people that come to your house and say, eh, "Did you notice Pastor Oyik's hair these days?" You are talking about who in my house? See, if a brother or a sister come to your house to discuss your pastor's life or your pastor's wife or anything that has to do with the leaders of your church. You know what you must do? Just go to the door and say, if I, if I count to three, you are still sitting in my house. Huh? I will, I will do to you something. See, now, is it that your, it is not your business, so whether, he said, eh, what is your business in trying to judge somebody else's servant? Whether he falls or he stands, it's none of your, when God called him, were you there? You were not there. So you have, if you have a business, kneel down and pray. Talk to God. Let God do something. If God cannot do it, nobody can do it. And if you try to do it, you will bring judgment on yourself. So three enemies. Number one. Please, after, tomorrow, after today, you have grace until this evening. From tomorrow, eh? reduce deliberately. Hmm? Tell breakfast or lunch. At least one. You remove at least one, if not two. Mama is saying, hey, my sweet food that I love. You have to choose between the glory and the stomach. Hallelujah. Excess eating and drinking, excess sleep, and familiarity with God. The day you become familiar with God and the things of God, you disconnect yourself from the glory. Amen. Now, three things you must do that will take you to the glory. Three things that will facilitate access to the glory. Number one is prayer. Leviticus, I mean, Luke chapter 9, he, when he took them to the mountain, they went to the mountain to do what? To pray. Transfiguration would only happen for those who give themselves to prayer. Everybody in the world knows no prayer, no power. Small prayer, small power. More prayer, more power. But Christians know that, but they don't pray. We want to manifest the power of God, but we do not want to pray. So if you want to see the glory of God, you must pray. Tell your neighbor you must pray. You must pray. Oh, you must pray. You must pray. I will pray. I will pray. I will pray. Oh, I will pray. Oh, I will pray. I will pray. I will pray. If I don't pray, Satan will make mess of me. You must pray. Jesus said, watch and pray. Let's what happened to you. Let's you fall into temptation. Show me a Christian that is not praying and I will tell you this is a sinner. Maybe that sin has not yet manifested, but it's already there. The moment the seed of sin enters your life, tag, the first thing that stops that sin will stop in your life is prayer. You can explain and you can justify. You can tell us you are busy. This is Lagos. You walk very far away and your husband is not saved. Your children are stubborn. Mama, when your prayer altar is dead, every other thing will begin to die. It's just a matter of time. See, the mist because of sleep, they didn't pray at the Mount of Transfiguration. They missed the Transfiguration. You know, Peter woke up from sleep. He saw Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And then he, he made a stupid statement. True? How was a stupid statement? 
Is that it's good for us to be here? We'll make three tents. One for you, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for... And God says, shut up your mouth. Which three tents? There's only one tent. If they must build a tent here, it's only one tent. This is the one that you must listen to. See, Peter from his sleep wanted to put Jesus, Moses, and Elijah on the same scale. God said, shut up. You are talking of things you don't know about. This is the one. This is my beloved son in whom I am well. Please listen to him. Hallelujah. At, the, at, at, at Gethsemane, he, he also slept. Didn't pray, right? When he woke up from his sleep, they came to arrest Jesus. He wanted to cut somebody's head. He missed the head and took the ear. If you don't pray, you will not be sharp. If you don't pray, you will not be accurate. If you don't pray, you will miss the target. If you don't pray, you will do bad investment. Businessmen, are you hearing me? You need to you need a strong prayer altar. See, you you want to go and compete with those people in the market in Lagos. They do voodoo power. They do village witchcraft. They do American witchcraft. They do white man witchcraft. They combine all of that to possess the Lagos market. You, you are here. You don't prayerless as you are. You want to go and compete with them in the market. And then you say, I've been investing, oh, and God, I don't know why God is not doing this for me. It's, God is not going to come and do some things for you if you don't, see, if you don't have an altar on which you are standing. God is not going to fight for you for nothing just because you come to church. Because you come to Oaks House Church. No. Hallelujah. So, glory obeys to prayer. If you give yourself to prayer, you open the door for the glory of God to appear. If you do what the Lord has commanded, the glory of the Lord will appear. Cornelius prayed. Cornelius did what? When he prayed, the glory appeared. The angel appeared. He said, your prayers. The first thing the angel said to Cornelius is that, I have come here because of your prayers. Number two. The number two thing that brings the glory of God, that manifests the glory of God in your life, is fasting. Please give yourself to fasting. Fasting is good for you. Not only for your spirit man, even for your physical body. Pastor Fred, you must observe the law of Sabbath even with your body. See, you see your stomach is a machine. It's a grinding meal. Every day you bring kokoyam. You bring cassava. You bring fufu. You know? At least once every week you must give that machine some rest. It will better off. See, if you want to live long, even physically live long on the earth and prevent yourself from sickness, you need to fast. You know that? Huh? You must give your stomach rest. One day a week, do cleansing. Don't, don't put food there, just water. And if you fast and pray, it will enhance your spiritual life and your physical life. It will draw you closer to the glory. See, the Jews, they fast at least twice a week. A normal Jew fasts at least twice a week. So there must be at least two days in a week where you are not... Nom, 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 nom. No, you don't sit around the table. Give yourself to God. You see, you see how the, let me show you how the law of Sabbath works. If two of us buy a car, the same kind of car from the factory, I'm not talking about the second hand, car, second hand cars that we, we bring from Europe. We go to the house, the, 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 the dealership, we buy brand new cars. I use my car as a private car and use yours as a public transport vehicle. After one year, when you see our two cars, what will happen? 
Man will still be very new, right? And his will be almost gone. Why? Because my car, when I go to the office, when I come to church, I park my car. While I'm preaching, my car is resting. Yours is carrying people from Ikeja to Yaba, from Yaba to I don't know where, everywhere in Lagos. It runs all day and all night, all round, round the year. By the end of the year, your car is good as dead. But it's the same age, oh. But when they see you, the same thing. That's what fasting does. When you give rest to your body, your organs rest, your stomach rest, your liver to rest. Because if it keeps working every day, it's just a matter of time, it will break down. Amen? So fasting is important. Make fasting a habit. A weekly habit. Make it what? Every week, there must be at least one or two days that you are given to just praying. Jesus said, this kind goeth not but by prayer and fasting. You need fasting to open the reins of the supernatural power of God to flow. Number three avenue to bring the glory. Shabu, are you ready for this one? You are giving. The angel said to Cornelius, two things brought me to your house. What? Prayer. And your arms, you are giving. Your prayer and your, your giving. Now when you read Matthew chapter 6, I think Matthew 6, let me check it. Jesus said, gave those three things that you must do to keep the heavens constantly open over your life. Let's look at Matthew 6. Yes. Matthew chapter 6 from verse 2. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have your, no reward from your father in heaven. Number 2. When you give, this, in this, Jesus gave them in this order. Number 1 thing you must do. When you give, do not do what? Announce it with trumpets as hypocrites. No, 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 no. He said you will order. But when you give, Without announcing it, what will happen? You will draw the eye of your heavenly father. Your heavenly father who sees in secret will reward you openly. No? So, giving is one of those things that will open the heavens over you. Giving without announcing. It's not this thing that we do in our church. How many of you will give one million naira? And then you come, they clap for you. Once you come here and we all clap for you, that's it. No? Yeah, the day will come when Pastor Fred will stand here and say, now we want to build a bigger auditorium and the budget is 50 million or 100 million naira. And we want to encourage you, please give and give generously to God. And then you will come and give it quietly. Just write and put in the offering basket. It's only the finance people and the pastor that knows that sister so, so and so gave 20 million. You know? And you even write on that, please, when you are saying thank you, or whoever, don't call my name. That is giving according to the Bible. Not this one that you come and give, everybody is seeing you, and everybody knows that you are the one that gave 20 million. And everybody will say, ah, you see that sister? She's the one that gave 20 million. Well, well. Jesus said, when you do that, you already have your reward. So, key number one, when you give. Number two, verse, if you go down verse some, some like six or seven, Jesus said, when you pray. Oh, yes, thank you. Number two is what? When you pray. And if you go down again, somewhere verse 12 or 13, thereabout, he said, when you fast. If you found it, put it off for me. Or there somewhere down. He said, when you fast. Yes, verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. Hallelujah. So from, from Jesus' teaching, three things that you must do 
to keep the heavens open over you and to attract the glory. Number one, when you when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. Amen. Now let me conclude by giving you the five avenues that will take you to the glory. We we'll do that and then I'm done for today. How many avenues? Five. Number one avenue that will take you to the glory is called God's sovereignty. God's what? God's sovereignty. He says, I will, do, I will be gracious to whom I am gracious and I will be merciful to whom I am. It is the sovereignty of God. He, he does with whosoever as he pleases. When you read Isaiah 65, verse 1 and 3, he said, I answered the people that didn't ask me for nothing and I showed myself to people that were not seeking for me. Can you? Yes, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. It is called God's sovereignty. So you can be eating ice cream and sleeping and God decides. He's sovereign. He can do that. But, but let me tell you, in this category, only 1% or 1 out of 10 million people fall in this category. So if you sit down there waiting for the sovereignty of God to locate you, if you were not on his list, you will wait until you go to the grave. Hallelujah. He said, I love Jacob. I hated Esau. They were not yet born. They had not yet done anything. We didn't even know how they looked. But God had already loved Jacob and had hated Esau. It is called God's sovereignty. But uh, bad news is very few people fall within this category. Amen. See, when I got saved, I told you, I have always been a lover of God, very passionate. Hallelujah. And I was hoping that I will, I will be qualified for this group until I waited 20 years and I discovered time is passing. Oh, this, see, Mama, when I started following Jesus, I didn't have one, eye, one ounce of beer. Now it's almost all white. No? When I discovered it's, it's getting white, I said, I need to do something. If I don't do something, so nothing may happen to me. Hallelujah. So, Avenue number one is called God sovereignty. Avenue number two is paying the price. He's doing what? Paying the price. And the good news is even our Lord Jesus was found in this second group. He was found in this second category of those who paid the price. About our Lord Jesus, it is said, it is him who, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7, in the days of his flesh, he did what? He offered up prayers and supplication with great crying and groanings. In the days of his flesh means that one day, Jesus found himself in the same position where you are. He was a common mortal like you and me. And he had to resort to praying. Not simple, not wishy washy prayers. Prayer with gro groaning and crying. The Bible says, he, though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Verse 9. And the Bible says, and being made perfect, he became the author of an eternal salvation unto them that obey him. God call of God and high priest. He was elevated in the place of a high priest. Not because he was called Jesus. He was elevated to the place of high priest because he learned to pray, he learned obedience, and he grew to perfection. Hallelujah. So if you sit down there and you are hoping that maybe you are of the first category, when I come back 20 years, when I come back to Lagos 20 years down the line, I may find you in the same spot. Hallelujah. So do something now. I can, I can, without being a prophet, I can tell that if the sovereignty of God has not yet located you, chances are it may never locate you. Hmm? Draw near to God 
and he will draw near to you. Who, who should take the first step? You. If you do not take the first step, God will be waiting. He's been waiting. Oh. Like I told you, Moses, he came in the burning bush and stood there and was waiting for Moses to turn. It's when Moses turned that God called. Hallelujah. So the second avenue is paying the price. You pay the price in fasting. You pay the price in praying. You pay the price by giving. You pay the price by walking. You must do something that will catch God's eye. Hallelujah. The third avenue. The third avenue is sonship. Is what? Sonship. <clears throat> Your position as a son, whether biological son or spiritual son, qualifies you to receive a transfer. You see my children in our house and just visit my household. Some mornings my babies wake up and they are covered with gold. They enjoy those benefits because they are my children. Because I have labored the door, the way is open. So because they, they you know, because of the, the connection they have with me, some of it rub off on them naturally. No? Yes. If you are the son, natural or spiritual son of someone who has accessed that realm, it can naturally, it will position you in a place where you can receive an inheritance. Because inheritance is never given to nephews. It's only given to sons. So sonship. When you meet the sons, even my spiritual sons, my pastors, when you meet them, when you hear them, you can tell these ones are coming from. When you hear them, you can say, we know where you're coming from. Some of them, even their voice, this, their voice sound like mine now. If they didn't go to a school to learn to talk like me. Just that they've been, you know, likes attract likes. The more you look at me, the more you are changing to my image. That's what contemplation does, right? So the sons of Pastor Fred were naturally they have it in their genes. It's already naturally given to them. Spiritual sons, the same. Your spiritual DNA is distilled to all the people that are in your. Hallelujah. Number, number what avenue? Number four. Acts of service. Any grace that you serve, any anointing that you serve, will naturally drop off on you. Acts of service and sacrifice. Like Elisha and Elijah, like, El em, like Joshua and Moses, Jesus and his disciples, if you serve an anointing or a grace, someday, boom, it manifests in your life. Hallelujah. And the, the fifth avenue is called impartation. You meet a man of God or a prophet and by God's sovereign act, he lays his hands on you and God takes a measure of it and bestows it. Hallelujah. Impartation will open the door for the glory of God to manifest. From the day that man of God laid his hands on me, suddenly something happened to me. Something was transferred to me. Peter said to the man at the gate, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give. If you have it, you can give it. True? If you have it, you can give it. So such as I have, I do what? I give unto you. Amen. Amen. Were you blessed today? Shall we stand and pray?